In today's podcast, we're going to discuss how Mercedes dominated the Japanese Grand Prix. How Ferrari, quite frankly, bottled the entire weekend. And how Red Bull did in the race at Suzuka. And of course, review all of the midfield teams. Right, so guys, here we are for a review of the Japanese Grand Prix. And here I am with Nib. How are you doing, mate, after that race? I am doing very, very well. All good. And now let's go into the review of all the teams. First off, Mercedes, who dominated the weekend. A 1-2 in qualifying and a 1-2 in the race. Even though Bottas did come under pressure from Max Verstappen at the end, they were never not going to get a 1-2. They just had clearly the fastest car at Suzuka. And going forward, of course, they're going to win both titles. And I think, Nib, they're probably going to dominate the rest of 2018, their car at the moment is just way, way too fast. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you there. The upgrades at Singapore and Russia and the issues with the Ferrari engine, which we'll get on to a little bit later, have definitely contributed into Mercedes now clearly having the fastest car. And this was always a track that would suit Mercedes, the first sector, is just Mercedes heaven for them. The fast, the fast corners, much like Silverstone and Austria, and to a certain extent, the first sector at at Coda. So a brilliant, brilliant weekend by Mercedes. Wouldn't expect anything less, really. And one two for them. It's two one twos in a row now, and both the constructors and the drivers' championship should be theirs. Next up is Ferrari, who just bottled the entire weekend. First in qualifying, where they went on the wrong tyres at the start of Q3, and then the drivers bottled their laps, meaning they started in 4th and ninth. And then in the Grand Prix, you know, such good work. First off for Sebastian Vettel, getting up to P4, and then having the contact of Max Verstappen. For me, it's clearly Vettel's fault. He doesn't deserve a penalty for it, but it's definitely Sebastian's fault. And then obviously came from the back of the grid and finished P6. He couldn't get any higher than that because he was too far back the top five cars. And for Kimi Raikkonen, I kind of feel sorry for him because obviously with the contact with Max, he did suffer some kind of damage or some kind of, had some kind of issue after that. So I do feel a bit sorry for him, but Ferrari just did not have the pace compared to Red Bull or clearly Mercedes. What a horrible weekend for Ferrari. Nib. What do you think about what has been just another embarrassing weekend for such a great team? Yeah, Ferrari have just completely lost plot now. On Friday, they they showed that they had no pace around here. Absolutely awful. Probably their worst Friday of the year. And Saturday was an absolute disaster. I didn't get to watch qualifying, but of course I watched it back. And... Sebastian Vettel and Kimi Raikkonen going out on the Inters at the start of Q3. What were Ferrari thinking? And then Vettel obviously goes wide at Spoon, I think it was, and is down in P9. And it was it just got from bad to worse the weekend for Ferrari. In the race, Vettel did a fantastic job to get up behind Verstappen so quickly. In my opinion, he had to go for the move. Because he might not have got him on the next straight. Who knows? We don't. We we can't foresee these sort of things. He had to go for. It. But at the end of the day, Max left enough room, and Vettel went into him. I don't blame Vettel for the incident. Like, as in, he shouldn't have got a penalty for it. It was definitely is what I meant to say. But he shouldn't have got a penalty. And with Kimi and Verstappen, I thought. Max was, was fine. I thought he did his best to try to stay on the track and rejoin on the track instead of cutting across the chicane like we've seen with Valtteri Bottas later in the race. So I think Max was trying to do the right thing, but he just got punished because he was at such a tight angle. There wasn't much Kimi could have done about it. And then obviously he got some damage from that contact, a bit of side, side pod damage, I believe. And obviously Vettel got a whole load of side pod damage and floor damage from the contact with Verstappen as well. So an absolute disaster of a weekend from Ferrari and it's how, they, how their year has just gone downhill after Germany. 
Now we go on to Red Bull, whose race was absolutely fantastic, finishing in third and fourth. They were clearly faster than Ferrari. Max Verstappen, despite his incidents with Kimi Raikkonen and Sebastian Vettel, was very fast and caught up to the back of Valtteri Bottas at the end of the race, but just doesn't have a fast enough car in a straight line to be able to actually overtake Valtteri Bottas. So unfortunate for him, but still... Another podium for Max at Suzuka. But for Daniel Ricciardo, clearly for me, the driver of the day on Sunday. What a drive from 15th to 4th. Brilliantly jumping Kimi Raikkonen in the pit stop phase. A very motivational drive considering how bad Saturday was. And Nib, I'm sure being a fan, you are so proud and so happy of your Australian driver. Well, I was able to see a little bit of qualifying on Saturday. And I turned on the stream from the uh, provider I've got, and I literally just see Ricardo being pushed down the pit lane. And I threw my phone on the floor. Didn't break, thankfully. It was on the it was on some grass, so didn't break. But I was absolutely fuming. And then obviously we've seen the Ricardo swearing as he was walking down the pit lane after he got out of the car. And to put in that performance quite comfortably for me, his best performance since Monaco, he absolutely was on fire this weekend. Absolutely on fire. He actually looked like on Friday that he was actually had quite similar pace to, to Verstappen, which we haven't seen in a while. So there was already some promising signs on Friday. We didn't get to see the result of that on Saturday, but boy, oh boy, did he put in a great performance on the Sunday absolutely brilliant overtakes and then to put in that stint that he did um just before the end before the first pit stop to get ahead of Kimi was absolutely fantastic and Max as usual was brilliant and well this Max Verstappen really is so good this can't be uh, pointed out anymore he is such a good driver and he is without a doubt going to win a world championship one day if he at the right time. So a good weekend for Red Bull. And let's see what the United States Grand Prix will bring for them. Now let's go on to the midfield and start off with McLaren, who had one of, again, their worst weekends of the season, qualifying basically last because the only car behind them was Marcus Ericsson, who was only last because he crashed in Q1. And then in the race, they only beat the two Williams cars, and that just shows you how bad McLaren is. Yes, they're probably not bringing any upgrades to the car, but that's not that's not an excuse. They should be, at the very least, on the edges of the points, kind of like Pierre Gasly was in his Toro Rosso. It's just, it's not good enough. Uh, Nib, what do you think about this absolute disaster? This was absolutely their worst weekend of the 21st century. They were... They were effectively last in qualifying. And in the race, the only reason why they ahead of them is because Williams did a two-stop strategy and they tried something different. And the only moment that we seen McLaren in the whole race was when Alonso went rally crossing the, across the gravel when Stroll um, forced him off the track at the end of the first lap. So absolutely disaster the weekend for them and there really is nothing to say about them anymore now we go on to Renault who had in terms of the race actually a better race than I thought with Carlos Sainz scoring points so very impressive there by Carlos but overall for the weekend about what I expected in terms of the pace of their car just not good enough not as good as Haas and Force India and with the final four tracks coming up I don't see how Renault can hold on to fourth. There's only eight points separating Renault and Haas now. How can Renault possibly keep on or uh, keep a hold of that when Haas are so quick and Renault just have no pace? Nib, do you honestly see Renault finishing fourth, or do you think somehow maybe in terms of getting a lucky moment they will hang on to that? No, I don't think Renault will finish um, fourth in the constructors. A very, very good point by Carlos Sainz this weekend, who once again outperformed Hulkenberg, who went out in Q1. And I think that shows to to everyone how bad the Renault is at the moment. They are legitimately 
at the tail end of the midfield now. I don't think most of us would have said that at the start of the season. Definitely the fifth quickest car in the midfield in the first few races. So their performance has really, really tailed off. But Carlos Sainz, great drive again. A very, well, could be a very important point. I don't think it would will be in the end, but getting a point, a good result. And I don't know how they will do in America. Carlos Sainz has had some very good results around there, but in this car, I don't think he will be able to. And at their home race for Haas, I think that they will get a double points finish. So I don't see Renault finishing ahead of Haas and the Constructors. At all. Next up is Force India, who had a good race in terms of scoring points for both cars in P7 and P9. Sergio Perez, I thought, had quite an underrated race coming through the field and finishing in a very important P7 in terms of Force India catching McLaren for P6 in the Constructors. His overtake on Roman Grosjean, even though it might have been maybe illegal, it was still a good overtake around the outside on the Haas driver, Ocon probably could have done a little more to get past Grosjean, but that's just the way it is. Seventh and ninth, that's a good finish. Nib, do you think Force India are going to have a good end to the season? I think this race kind of proves they will. Definitely. Once Perez overtook Grosjean, which was around lap 40, he finished eight seconds ahead of him, so it quite clearly shows that Force India do have the best car of the top of the midfield and it probably should have been seventh eighth this weekend for them esteban ocon obviously got that three place grid penalty from practice i think it was yeah practice three and that made him start 11th so it was a good drive for him to get ninth and with perez and grosjean he was 2.4 seconds behind him uh when the virtual safety car come out and then he, him and his engineer were in close uh, communication during the virtual safety car and he was managed and he managed to close up to Grosjean by, by the end of Degna, just because he was very smart the way that he um, was during the VSC. I'm not exactly what he did, but I was read an article. And he, he knew what he was doing apparently. So I'd hope he would anyway. So, a great job by Perez there to get ahead of Grosjean because it would have been very hard to get past the good Ferrari engine in which is in the back of that house. So great job by Perez. And yeah, once again, I keep saying this and have done for the last few podcasts, another great weekend for Force India. Next up is Williams who had basically the race we were expecting. They did have a good qualifying, but in terms of the Grand Prix, Right at the back. Yes, they did do, I think, one stop more than everyone else. But realistically, I think where they finished was about right. Wouldn't you think, Neb? Yeah, definitely. And the only time we've seen them on TV was with, was with Lance Stroll. And that was a very good overtake around the end. So, through 130R. But then he went a bit wide and then four Alonso off the track. And then we both of them got penalties from that incident. But yeah, about where you'd expect... Williams to be in a, in a good qualifying lap in, in Q1 to get him out of Q1. So, quick shout out for that. Now we go on to Toro Rosso, who at basically the home race with Honda, I think had a good weekend. Yes, they did not score points, but as Pierre Gasly said after the race, the reason they didn't finish in the points that they should have is because of an error on their strategy. If they didn't have that, I think they would have finished maybe 8th or 9th in the Japanese Grand Prix. A great qualifying, of course, P6 and P7. They are definitely Honda making progress. Great news for Red Bull, and I think great news for the sport, because if we can have a third uh, engine manufacturer doing well like Ferrari and Mercedes, that's great for competition at the front of the field. Nib, what did you think overall of Toro Rosso and Honda this weekend? A brilliant weekend for Honda and for Toro Rosso, who ultimately should have got points with both cars, in my opinion. But once again, like Hungary, they messed up the strategy. I know Brendan Hartley got stuck behind the Williams and Ericsson in the end, 
and he was overheating his tyres a lot. Um, Gasly and Hartley both had that issue. So that seems to be an issue for Toro so for this race, at least, because previously they hadn't had any issues with overheating tyres, both drivers have said. So that's a little bit of a point for concern. But I certainly expect Toro Russell to have a very strong weekend again at Kota as their engine is quite clearly the third best on the grid now. Next up is Haas, who I guess with Roman Grosjean scoring points had a good race in terms of beating Renault, but it could have been better because P7 was definitely up for grabs as Grosjean was for a long time at the front of that midfield. But still, uh, an 8th place finish is a good finish for him. But Kevin Magnussen, of course, involved in a very controversial incident with Charles Leclerc and Nib. I've I've ranted enough about this. What did you think of the crash overall? Kevin Magnussen just can't help himself, can he? He has a few races where he doesn't have incident, and then he's an absolute, complete, and utter idiot in this race. And then how on earth the stewards haven't given him a penalty for that incident, I will never understand. Charlie White has come out and said that Magnussen and Leclerc made the decision practically at the same time to move right. But that doesn't matter. The decision that he has made to go right is too late. It's too late. Leclerc is right on the back of him. You can't just suddenly move to the right. Like, when the driver's going to move... Like, the guy, the guy can't just run into the back. you got to move one side or the other. You should be making your move earlier than that. We've seen a few years ago with Max and Kimi both at Hungary and Spa, and once again we've seen it, and once again we've seen the FIA not punish it. I think it's an absolute joke, and how Magnussen has not got a penalty for this absolutely baffles me. Thankfully, he ruined his own race by being a complete and utter idiot, and sadly, it ruined Charles Leclerc's race. And thankfully, no one else was caught up in because I know Daniel Ricciardo was right behind him. But oh, it's so frustrating with Magnussen sometimes. He's so, so good. He's got great pace. And he just does silly, stupid things. I don't understand it. He just doesn't need to do it. I don't understand. I really don't. But good result for Roman Grosjean, P8. The best that Haas really could have hoped for in the race is Force India just have the faster car at the moment and hopefully if Magnussen isn't silly at the American Grand Prix they can get double points finish which I do believe they will get so oh I think that's the rant over there and finally is Sauber who had quite a disappointing I guess qualifying and racing qualifying they should have got a car in the top 10 but they didn't because Ericsson crashed and Charles Leclerc was unlucky with the conditions and for the race Again, I kind of feel like they're unlucky. Charles Leclerc, of course, of that incident with Kevin Magnussen and then retired with some kind of mechanical issue uh, at Degna 1, about 15 laps from the end. And with Marcus Ericsson, because he started at the back, was never really going to score points. He did finish up in P12, which is a good result, uh, but did have an unusual race because he did hit the back of Charles Leclerc on the safety car restart, which obviously is not smart of him, but... You know, it happens sometimes. But Sauber, I think, Nib, even though, you know, they're not a big team or they haven't been amazing this season, they'll be disappointed they didn't score points this weekend because they definitely had the promise to do so. Yeah, definitely. Charles just, just missed out on Q3. So maybe if he'd gone in Q3, things would have been a little bit different. He would have been a little bit further away from that silly person, Kevin Magnussen, and who knows, it could have t the race could have turned out a lot differently. That moment just completely ruined his race. But up until then, it was it was going good, but after that, just went downhill. He kept having issues at Degna One all weekend, and then looks like something broke on the car. We don't actually know what happened to his car. What what the issue was, but then obviously went spearing off into the gravel at Degna, nearly hit the wall, 
and retired the car. And for Marcus Ericsson, he did a good job at keeping Brendan Hartley behind him in the race after Toro Rosso's strategy blown up. And obviously had that moment, which he, which he has come out and said was very, very scary for him when he hit the back of Charles at the end of the safety car uh, period. So thankfully nothing serious happened there and there was only a little bit of damage to Ericsson's car. But overall, a, a quite a positive weekend for Sauber Ironfield. They, yeah, they should have got points, but there's nothing they can do when that sort of driving goes on in front of them when they're trying to overtake them. And now, guys, to end this podcast, let's get on to some questions. The first one is from Benny Boy, and it's to do with Sebastian Vettel. He asks, has Vettel's faith on Ferrari been lowered in the three and a half years since they've been together, and may he repeat Alonso in finding something different before the end of his F1 career? And he also asks, what can Vettel and Ferrari achieve with four races left? When it comes to Vettel's faith in Ferrari... I think it has been lowered, but I don't think it's been lost because from the comments he's been putting out there, it seems as though Sebastian still does have faith in his team. But there has been stuff that Ferrari has done which may have lowered that in the three and a half years, no doubt. Uh, When it comes to him maybe doing another racing series, I don't think so. I think Vettel is a, a person that will only do F1. I don't see him racing in DTM or you know, WEC or anything like that. And what can Ferrari achieve for the final four races? I think there's only one race they can win, which is the Mexican Grand Prix. If they don't win that, then if Mercedes don't have, you know, reliability issues, I don't see how Ferrari are going to have a successful one to 2018. Niv, what do you think? Well, Ferrari haven't always been the most faith in the team. That's... But... The last few certainly haven't helped Sebastian Vettel, but I don't think you can blame Ferrari all that much because at the end of the day, it also has been partly Sebastian Vettel's fault for for some of the failures that they have had. And I I completely agree with you. I don't see him racing in any other series other than one. And with Ferrari in the last four races, what can they do? I don't think they'll win another race. I think... In the slow speed corners, that's where they're losing Shah. And then obviously at the last sector of Mexico is all slow speed corners. So I don't see them winning Mexico. The only race where I think they have a possibility of winning is Brazil. But I don't, I don't even know there now. So I don't think they'll win another race, honestly. And now to end off, we have a final few questions from Lord No Telling. The first one is, will Toro Rosso stay ahead of Salva in the Constructors? I don't think they will. I think Salva will get 8th. I think it'll be Abu Dhabi where Salva get that 8th place finish. Um, Nib, do you think that as well? Or do you think Toro Rosso will keep 8th? Yeah, I think Toro Rosso will stay ahead of Salva. I don't see Salva scoring like major points. And I think Toro Rosso might get a few points in a few races with their upgraded Honda engine, so yeah, I think we'll stay ahead of Stella. He also asked, do you think that it was the battery system that gave Ferrari the edge right before the summer break, and if so, has the FIA's actions put an end to Ferrari's chances? I believe this battery system did put Ferrari ahead, say, from Silverstone till about the Italian Grand Prix. I definitely think that's why they had the fastest car at that time, and when it comes to the FIA's actions... Yes, I think it has. And if this battery system is illegal, then they can't really complain because it's illegal. If they're, you know, if the FIA are trying to find out if it's not legal and and Ferrari are not using it, then it must be illegal because why would they not use it? I I just don't get it. Nib, what do you think about all of that? Yeah, I think the battery system and also Ferrari had a very good car and equal to Mercedes. That's definitely what put them ahead right before the summer break. But now Mercedes have upgraded their car and Ferrari has obviously had these issues with this, some more sensors being put around the where the battery is. So, yeah, the FIA's actions has put an end to Ferrari's chances. I think after Monza, it was always going to be very difficult, but 
with Ferrari being forced on that a lower um, battery switch, whatever it is, um, the FI have definitely put the end of Ferrari's chances of winning the title to bed because they needed to win at Silver, that's not Silver, so that's Singapore to have any chances of winning the world title and they didn't and in the resulting races they've been absolutely hammered so yeah I think the FIA's decision has put Ferrari's chances to bed the next one is has Daniel Ricciardo destroyed his career by going to Renault and should he have stayed another year I don't think we can say right now if he has destroyed his career we have to see what happens in 2019 and 2020 yes right now Renault are not looking good. They're miles off the pace of, say, what Red Bull are. And Honda are looking good for 2019. But you don't know. Renault might be way better in uh, 2019. No one thought Haas in 2018 would be so good. So you don't know, you know, how this decision will be viewed upon right now. You have to wait a couple of years. Nib, do you think he has destroyed his career? Or do you think, like me, we have to wait, say... To the end of 2019 or 2020? Well, I definitely think we have to wait and see to pre-season testing and obviously the Australian Grand Prix, but I'm going to say this. Hashtag believe in Renault. And the final one is, is car development pretty much over for most of the teams for this year besides Toro Rosso? Basically, yes, because Toro Rosso, they're not developing kind of for themselves. They're developing their car and the Honda Power Unit to show Red Bull what Honda can do for 2019 and possibly 2020. So, yeah, Toro Rosso, that's why they keep bringing upgrades. And for the rest of the teams, yeah, they're not bringing any upgrades because we have a new regulation change for 2019, so there's no point bringing anything new to the final four races. So, guys, that's been it for the Japanese Grand Prix podcast. The next podcast will be at the weekend, but the next race, of course, is... The United States Grand Prix, hopefully, Nib, as we have had most of the time, we should have a very exciting United States Grand Prix. Yeah, hopefully we'll have a very good Grand Prix. And I must say, thank you for everyone who has subscribed and just viewed and commented or liked any of Chaz's videos this weekend. The, the support and growth has been amazing. So thank you to everyone. But anyway, guys, that has been it for this video. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Don't forget, guys, I'll be back with part three of my classic F1 Seasons 2012 series. Don't forget as well to join my Discord server, link below in the description, also with my Twitter and my website. Comment down below what you thought of this video and comment down below what did you think of the topics we discussed. Please comment down below what you think about those topics and until next time, it's been me, Chazzer HD. Goodbye. <laughs>